Welcome to uh, the Four Freedoms panel at Sundance 2045. We're going to start by talking with Four Freedoms artist, digital historian, and ethic maker, Louise Rivera. So Louise, you worked with the Indigenous Council for Biodiversity and Biotic Rights in the Americas, and you are a coded historiographer That's right. with the Guild of Future Architects. Correct. And before that, you worked as um, a ethic maker in the Cortez administration. A very impressive resume. Um, so today I'd like to get into uh, the idea of policy making versus ethic making. But first, you came to us with a very remarkable story of how you came to the US. Uh, yeah, it's, um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you migrated um, during the child separation policy under the Trump presidency, and you were separated from your family for about an entire week. Uh, yeah. um, you must be really young at the time. What do you remember? Hello, everyone. Um, not a lot, actually. Uh, I remember being separated from my mother, but I didn't really get what was going on until years later. But looking back in totality, it's hard to even imagine a time period like that, considering the strides we've made as a society since then. The sustainability ethic, the Industrial Prison Complex Reparations Act, the decriminalization ethic, uh, inclusion, and on and on. We, we now know the Trump era led to the end of the political class and the corruption of money in politics. We know Trump was a one-term president who caused the demise of the very establishment he was perpetuating. But like I said, back then it was scary. We didn't know the future. All we knew was we had to fight. But that did lead to politicians being replaced by artists as policy and later ethic makers, so that's good. Which, come to think of it, uh, it's quite surprising it took us that long to make that shift, right? You think about it, um, artists inspire, engineers design and build. What do politicians do? Today? Not much. <laughs> <laughs> it's like that, uh, that song, uh, Kendrick Lamar. Remember that Kendrick Lamar album from back in the day? What was that song? Yeah, well, I, I voted for him. Oh, yeah, so did I. <laughs> that was uh, AOC one that year. And you worked for her administration. Did she know you voted for him? I'm from L.A. She gets it. <laughs> well, you have a son now. Does he ever ask you about the 20s? You know, that the end of a 200-year cycle of unsustainable growth, that dramatic shift from people as consumers to people as creators? No, because he's five. Um, but he's all into code camp, right? Which is uh, whatever. Yeah. Uh, my niece does, though. And... Um, so she was studying consumer, the consumer age in school, hypercapitalism, the wealth gap. Like I said, it's hard to imagine now. Anyway, so my niece is like confronting me. She keeps saying like, what did you do with all the stuff? So I'm like, what stuff? And she's like, the stuff, like apparently old people like stuff. And then I'm like, so, I mean, I'm, am I that old? And she says, you're yeah, you, old. You old people. Yeah, yeah you old people. So then, then, she's like, then she's like, so why didn't you just stop buying stuff? And I thought, I was trying to explain to her, there was like commercials and ads, and she was like, well, why did people let them do that? And I was like, well, you couldn't really limit speech, even though, I don't, I don't know, I'm not sure ads really qualify as speech, now that I think about it. Um, but then she said, well, could you choose not to be advertised to? And I was like, well, I don't know. Like, I guess not, because there's pop-ups and posters and like, and then she gets like offended, like deeply offended, and she says, so you guys knew you were hurting the planet, right? Like, everybody knew. And I was like, sort of? And then she just gets this deeply perplexed look of like confusion, and she just says, weird, and then she like walks off. How old is she? Uh, she's eight now. Wow, I want to meet this young human. Uh, is she here with us? No, uh, but I'm here with my son. It's, it's funny you bring up um, the border thing. So there's something I truly hadn't considered in, until today about empathy. 
So I was walking with my son through the history of Four Freedoms Gallery, and we stopped at that iconic photo of the little girl looking up the border agent. But it was, it was like, it was VR, it was beautiful, it was... Anyway, um, I always empathize with that little girl. She wasn't crying because of a policy or a belief. She was crying because she wanted her mom. And I remember wanting my mom. I remember, th I, I remember that very feeling. And then I looked down at my son, and all at once it hit me how my mother must have felt. I'm sorry. My son is only a few years older than that little girl was at the time, and the idea of anyone taking him from me is horrifying. And then suddenly I realized how much it must have affected my mother the rest of her life. She was always affectionate with me in a way she wasn't with my brother and sister, but I knew she didn't love them more than me. It didn't make sense. And then I'm looking at my son and it, it hits me what was going on. She was reminded every time she left me of the trauma of losing her son. And then every time she picked me up again, she was reminded of being reunited with her baby. Does that make you angry? No, actually. It makes me thankful. That photo, that, that photograph makes me think about what artists do and why I am an artist. Four Freedoms took something horrific and turned it into something beautiful. And in that moment, I learned something about my mother and managed to miss my entire life. That's beautiful. So now, last question. What is the distinction between a policy and an ethic? A policy iterates something to profit the few, whereas an ethic demonstrates something for the greater good of everyone. In the era of meaning making, policies are outdated. They're obsolete. Thank you, Louise. Thank you. Welcome to the Four Freedoms panel at Sundance 2020, not 2045, but I hope that gave you a little bit of a glimpse of why we have this incredible movement happening in the United States of America. I'd like to welcome Hank Willis Thomas, Eric Gottesman, and Michelle Wu to the stage. <laughs> I've been a fan and, a, and, and been following this community for the last, what has it been, five years now? five years, um, that they have been galvanizing a, the largest collective art project in U.S. history. And the thing that I, I, I'm a senior consultant to the Sundance Institute, a former staffer, uh, wow. and part of the, the mob family of Sundance for the rest of my life. Um, and I get the great opportunity of working with Tabitha Jackson and Brenda Coughlin on centering artists in the conversation around our civic life, around our culture, and around how we are stewarding this planet. Um, and I have to say that, you know, this panel um, represents the citizen artists that are taking back the space from being fragmented and burnt out and scattered and the social justice workers that are in, in community with the, with the artists to take back the kind of fragmented, like, rush that we're all in and finding a center of gravity together so that we have more power. Um, and, you know, there's a question. You know, right now, the Four Freedoms Group is establishing an artist party platform for 2020. And the question Tabitha Jackson asked is, are artists monolithic, like a Democratic Party or a Republican Party? And the answer that came from this incredible group and the work that they've been doing is that artists are not monolithic, and that's a really important point, that it's quite diverse. But the thing that artists have in common that needs to be centered in our political conversation and how we steward the, this next hundred years is that artists understand the nuances of the human condition. And that's something that we cannot ignore as we design for climate crisis, um, how, we, how we negotiate climate crisis, how we negotiate exponential technologies like artificial intelligence, how we um, negotiate you know, the future of work and all of these things that are pending for our generation to navigate. So with that, I would like to welcome the Four Freedoms team and have them share some insights around what we are doing here today together. <laughs> um, I'm Michelle, and I'm one of many who make and create what Four Freedoms is, is going to be, has become. Um, as Kamal mentioned, we're a collective of artists across the entire country, even 
other parts of the world that explore ways of how to drive art and artists to the center of public discourse in ways that we can use our platforms in creative practice to increase civic engagement and participation. Um, last, well, I guess it was 2018, now it's 2020. Um, in 2018, we um, embarked on our most ambitious project to date, called, which was called the 50 State Initiative, where we invested and created a tool kit that we distributed across the country. Um, and we ended up partnering with around 300 institutions and over 700 artists in all 50 states, including DC and Puerto Rico, to do uh, decentralized um, art actions um, in conversation with the current political climate at the time. Um, and building off of that uh, moment, um, as we look towards this historic year, we'll be hosting our first national convening in LA um, at the end of February, um, where we'll be bringing all of our institutional and creative collaborators together in person for the first time to collectively build the first artist design political platform. Um, we plan to do this through artist design and facilitated workshops and activities across three days. Um, and have been, uh, we will be generously hosted by uh, MOCA, um, the Hammer Museum, um, the Japanese American National Museum, and, and other amazing, amazing folks doing really great civic, um, creative centered work. Um, we will be using this platform as the foundation for our next big moment, um, again, as we look towards the election and beyond, because we have many more elections ahead of us. So it's, it is about engaging in this moment, but also how do we create a more resilient foundation uh, looking forward? Yeah, and I, I, I'm still shook by that uh, first performance of Robin. Me too. I not know you could <laughs> act, man. That Wait, was... first of all, I gotta say, I didn't even say that was the Futurist <laughs> Writers Room of the Guild of Future Architects. Thank you so much. <laughs> And, and instead of Gretchen, it was Sharon Chang, and instead of Louise, it was Robert Sinclair. <laughs> that was Sorry amazing. That. And it's amazing to think, like, in terms of history, I mean, our name, Four Freedoms, harkens back to the Four Freedoms of FDR. We've been thinking a lot about, um, actually, lately, the Civil War um, and, and movements before and after, uh, you know, leading into the war and leading out of the war. I've been sort of, you know, I think one of the things that we've been thinking about a lot is is that artists are storytellers. I mean, we don't need to go over that in this room, obviously. Everybody knows that and that that's at the basis of everything that happens, right? Um, but it's not just artists that are storytellers. Um, you know, stories are told through politics, through, you know, um, other mechanisms. So I've been, I've, I've been really obsessed with this 1869 speech by Frederick Douglass um, called the Composite Nation Speech where, uh, you know, in the face, coming out of Reconstruction and, and at a time where the country, you know, the North and South were trying to figure out this new kind of equilibrium, um, there was also a movement to, you know, the Chinese Exclusion Act was intended to kind of stop new people from coming in the country and, and projecting fears. And so Douglas was kind of painting this picture um, of a composite nation which he described as, we are a country of all extremes, ends, and opposites. The most conspicuous, conspicuous example of composite nationality is in the world. Our people defy all the ethnological and logical classifications. Now, nationalism in 2020 looks really different. You know, I, I, even though as part of this kind of project in Four Freedoms, there have been times where I've literally wrapped myself in an American flag uh, I don't feel very comfortable with that. And, you know, the idea of nationalism is something that, you know, I, I, I've had to kind of reckon with. And, and Douglas's ideas around this are really kind of, you know, talk about going to the future and thinking backwards. I mean, I think he was thinking way, way ahead. I mean, he, I, I'm going to read you a little bit more of this speech. He said, I'm especially to speak to you of the character and mission of the United States with special reference to the question whether we are the better or the worse for being composed of different races of men. I propose to consider first what we are, 
Second, what we are likely to be. And third, thirdly, what we ought to be. Our national mission seems plain and unmistakable. It's to make the to make the perfect national illustration of the unit and dignity of the human family that the world has ever seen. <clears throat> we should take counsel of both nature and art in the consideration of this question of, nation of nationalism. When the architect intends a grand structure, he makes the foundation broad and strong. We should imitate this prudence in laying the foundation of the future republic. There's a law of harmony in departments of nature. The oak is in the acorn. The career and destiny of individual men and women are enfolded in the elements of which they are composed. The same is true of a nation. Um, as these are rich and varied or poor and simple, slender and feeble, broad and strong, so will be the life and destiny of the nation itself. This story that he was trying to compose lost in the short term, right? The story that wove together the North and the South was not one uh, it, it was not a story of nationalism, of composite nationalism. Um, it was a story of states' rights that's, you know, in some places still taught today as, as what the Civil War was about because it was too dangerous to teach what it was actually about. Um, but, you know, like reading Douglas today and thinking ahead, thinking about the, way, the ways in which artists think outside of the scopes of time, um, it makes me imagine that I could sign on to his vision of nationalism. Um, and, you know, that any speech or work of art or film um, could help somebody a century later imagine themselves, you know, a place for themselves within a society. Kind of makes this question that we're asking today, how can artists shape politics, irrelevant. Art is politics. Um, and there's really no That's difference. That's my line. All right. <laughs> Sorry. You take it. Done. Well, I, just a little little quick interception there. Um, I was at the Cerdna Foundation's Constellations Conference a week ago in Dallas, and um, Faviana, uh, social justice, she presented on empirical data that storytellers culture is 10 years ahead of policy. Mm. Like a whole graph of how we are 10 years ahead of all policy. And a lot of times artists get dismissed as being too fuzzy for making real impact and really changing uh, you know, at least, you, you know, and a lot of times in philanthropy, that's hard to get funding for something that's so fuzzy as art. Um, but the reality is, that is where the imagination, our collective imagination starts, which then enacts the shift into a political change, right? Yeah. Hank, what you doing up here? Because he told me to. <laughs> um, hi, everyone. It is so good to share this moment with you. I especially want to thank our interpreters uh, who are making us sound smarter and more articulate than we uh, often are. Um, I, I think because I see the heart that you bring to the work that you do, I, um, I am truly inspired and am grateful that my voice can carry further. I'm grateful that my voice can carry further um, to the people who are watching this in the distant future at home <laughs> um, in their underwear. <laughs> um, I'm also grateful to our ancestors um, who brought us here um, from the distant past, present, and future. And um, tw 20 years ago, on Sunday, um, Robert Sinclair um, held me up when I lost my brother, so I'm going to Thomas Willis. And I'm so grateful for, for that. And um, I met Kamal on our chance. Um, outing, looking for black people at NYU uh, 25 years he ago. He was like, is she black? I don't know. <laughs> um, because oftentimes um, we're afraid um, that we won't be seen as human beings unless we're amongst one another. Um, I've, we've grown a lot and learned a lot um, throughout life and recognize that what people don't see in me um, is likely a limitation um, in the stories uh, that we're told, they're, they're told about themselves. And what I don't see in myself is also likely a limitation of what I've been told or accepted about myself. So uh, the motto that my cousin left me with was love over rules. I got a few pens in my pocket I found. I lost my wallet on the way because I got so excited. So I'm gonna just leave these here. Um, but I also wanna acknowledge the, you know, all of our brothers and sisters and aunts and uncles. Um, I, I learned uh, through a documentary that said that about 
going back to, for most African Americans, going back to slavery, we're seven generations away. And by that time, we're made up of 128 different people. Um, what are the chances that many of us in this room aren't connected through one of those 128 different people who made decisions um, that led them to fall in love and make connections with people that brought us here. And I met Norman Lear a few years ago on his 91st birthday, and hopefully he'll come to our Congress, working on it, working on it. Um, and um, I, he, 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 I like to tell the story, he took my hand. He went to, he's like, it's good to meet, he had a martini, it was one o'clock in the morning. Um, he's like, it's great to meet you. It's great to meet you. And I said that. <laughs> he said, you know why? Why? He said, it's because every minute, every hour, every second of my life has brought me to this moment. And I'm so grateful to share it with you. And I was like, <laughs> okay, when I'm 91 years old with Martini, I'm going to be looking into a young person's eyes and inspiring them that way. This is the prototype planning session um, where we're going to be collecting from all of you uh, ideas for the first U.S. Artist Party platform that For Freedom is then going to take to L.A. in February with the 300 delegates from all 50 states are going to be there. They're going and other other parts of the world and too. other parts of the world: um, Zimbabwe, South Africa, Japan, Hong Kong. It goes wow, yeah. I didn't know that. That's amazing. <laughs> and then uh, Brenda Coughlin and Tabitha are going to present what you guys, what we collect here today to the artists there, and then they're going to build on that until we have at the end of that Congress. Uh, like the Democratic National Convention would produce a party platform and so forth. We're going to have a U.S. Arti par artist party platform and then Four Freedoms through their network of arts institutions across the entire uh, 50 states and artists across the entire 50 states are going to take that as a unified vision to then carry into town halls and into bus stops and lawn sign activations and um, all of the work that will be happening on the grounds during this 2020 election. And so we, this is how it's really important for us to have that conversation. The first two people we're going to call to the stage, thank you so much for setting us up, is um, two artists. <laughs> well, thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, to kind of set the stage for, for what we're asking of you, um, I have two amazing artists that are going to come up and share a little bit about their creative practice and the values that have kind of emerged out of that practice that they feel are important to bring to the center of this conversation for the U.S. Artist Party platform. Alyssa Moorhead and Khalil Joseph. Alyssa. Welcome. Hello. I, I could go on and on and on about how much I respect these two people's work. Um, Khalil Joseph is a major inspiration for me in terms of um, profiling my community in South LA, where I'm from, Watts, uh, black community, Latinx community, and holding space for the nobility and the beauty that's there, not the inferiority complex and the degradation of the stories that, that go across our mass media and that mythologies, but he tells the heart of the, of the people that are really there. And I can never thank you enough for doing that for my, my, my people and my ancestors. My last living slave grandma built a farmhouse in Watts and lived to 1963. So that's, that's, my, that's my home, and I thank you for that. And Alyssa Moorhead uh, is Alyssa. with Tahir Hempel and uh, Sean Peters and Bradford Young and Rada Blank are building an incredible intentional community in Baltimore. And the way I look at Alyssa's work is she is somebody that holds space and grows roots into the ground while spreading with her creative artistry these branches up into the sky. She's one of those few people that can do both grounded work and ascend, ascend, work that ascends simultaneously. So thank you both for being here. We'll, we'll start with, uh, with Alyssa. Yeah, I want to hear about what you're doing in Baltimore. I don't know. <laughs> um, and it's Elisa, we were just talking oh, we about were, that. I was trying to do the right way, and then I switched. know, you messed yourself up. You were right before. Um, I don't know. You know, I'm, I'm sitting here, and I'm just sort of absorbing it in real time and thinking about, um, you know, a conversation, a long conversation, years long, but, but, but that culminated in the conversation this morning with Khalil about, um, you know, what, what does, what are the modalities, and, and Khalil was sort of, pushing me to say it's less about talking about what exists and what's here. We're futurist by, by the fact that we create. Um, so his real question was, well, what are the models? And I'm not sure that they exist necessarily in our field as opposed to in our practice as um, 
migrated Africans <laughs> or you know women or or communities that are focused on collaboration, which is not really uh, practiced in the West, and in fact has been quite legislated against. Um, so you know we've just been thinking out loud about what models do we copy. Some of them we just do organically. So Baltimore is just you know, me wanting to do hood rat stuff with my friends. <laughs> to hear Terrence, uh, Sean, Rada. Um, and also, you know, more intentionally avoid what's happened in our homes like Brooklyn, DC, uh, Oakland, um, in terms of the land grab that has um, discontinued in some ways, or at least slightly interrupted our process as artists. Yeah, I'm still I'm still blown away by Luis's, <laughs> um, mostly because uh, I think that's what I subscribe to mostly, which is um, knowing full heartedly that uh, artists create the future. And that's a huge responsibility, but it's also um, kind of amazing to know um, that things that I might make or could influence how society. Um, you know, thinks about it. So, for instance, uh, I was talking today with Lisa in the car in an Uber. Um, the guy who I think is the leading, he's like the Elon Musk of uh, designer DNA. I read an article about him, and uh, he was most inspired by Gattaca, which is a movie that came out in 1998, which is, you know, it was a, f a completely fictional future. And here he is actually now leading the cause. But I also read a book called Art and Physics, um, which was amazing. It basically laid out that all art had predated all kind of scientific um, discovery, from like cubism and uh, the theory of relativity to all kind of amazing stuff. And so that's kind of where I come from. Yeah, and what and, and just a, a factoid on that, um, I was just at Afrotectopia at Google, and Ashley Jane Lewis, a researcher at NYU, dropped the fact that 87% of the current technology and development right now is all from science fiction narratives. 87%. Like that's a, that's just, and that's just the technology. That's not cultural shift, mindset shift, community design, like how you guys are intentionally holding space for your communities to evolve healthy and, and well and with a sense of identity that's empowered. Um, and, a, and a thriving shared prosperity, too. In both of your cases, you're embedded in South LA, you're embedded in Baltimore, and in both cases, I've come to both spaces. I've been to both Khalil's um, Underground Museum in LA, and I've been to Baltimore, and been with the collective Insight Baltimore, and I cannot tell you how much your spaces have affected my heart in terms of a sense of hope that we can hold space to thrive and not just be on defense. Um, you know, we're in the, f I'm sorry to take this over, but we're, especially for black communities, we're in the fifth wave of social control in this country, right? You have, um, we, you know, the transatlantic slave trade, and then we started organizing with the white indentured servants. The, we were the majority in the colonies. We were starting to politically organize, even intermarry. And then there was a massacre in New York, boom. Uh, they started colorism and the overseer and the big house and then field, you know, and all that stuff to divide and conquer. And the policies came in about misogyny and all the, I mean, misogynation and all that. Then we started with Civil War, we came out of it, we started to have Reconstruction, we had Black Wall Street, we were starting to see universities and education and doctors and all of the things for us to have a whole community. Then we had the KKK terrorism and the policies around the, the Jim Crow. Then we came out of it with the Civil Rights Movement, we started to get rid of redlining, we started to whatever evolve, and then we had mass incarceration and the, and the new form of terrorism which came through the police. And now we're evolving out of that with Black Lives Matter. We're trying to find a way to hold that center of gravity again. And now we're already having to deal with the new Jim Code, with algorithmic injustice. And so this is a pattern that we have now seen five times in this country, just as a black community, not talking about any other communities that are part of this political landscape. And I have hope that we can intervene and not fall into that pattern one more time because of the spaces that you guys are creating as artists and as cultural makers and placemakers. So can you talk about how do you do that? How do you hold that space when there's so much, like we know that when people tried to do this in the 70s and the 60s, they got bombed by their government. Yeah. So how, do you, how are you holding that space? I mean, I, I, I guess I should sort of like 
start by saying I'm in no way an activist. You know, I'm friends with people like Tarana Burke and Lumumba Mandeli and people who their impetus is, is outside of themselves and they've dedicated their entire lives to my liberation. So it's a very different gig. Um, you know, as an artist, it's quite internal and sometimes, you know, dark or inappropriate or, you know, the things that come into my head for me to make um, things. And so they are catalysts um, for, for my freedom, you know. And I think, you know, there are times where I see overlap. You know, when I think about, like, what Ava DuVernay's film did in conjunction with um, what Malika Ciro, who is a proper activist, was doing with the FCC in order to allow... Um, black folks to re receive phone calls while incarcerated. Um, that's one of those times where you see the imagination and activism, you know, really work together. But um, for the most part, I really just spend a lot of time uh, in, in my head and with creative people trying to think about how we can find ways to express ourselves and how we can interrupt hegemony and patriarchy in, in our lives, you know? Um, so I don't think of anything that I make as a sort of creative document, I mean, a, a sort of art uh, activist document. Um, but sometimes if it lands that way because of what's in our bodies already and what's in our history, you know, that's great. I'm, I'm gonna embarrass my friend Rada, who's here, who did the 40 year version, who's here now. <laughs> Which we get, we get to enjoy that you know, in, in, in a couple of hours, but that's a document that's being, been created for those 40 years and, and even before that. And the things that activists do is interrupt things like the patriarchy that, that, has, uh, that she had to navigate or, you know, so that document is something that will hopefully engender change and, and talk about a particular experience that is shared across the world. But, but that's not the impetus to make those things. Um, so, so for me, I'm very grateful to your activism and to the activism of people that give us the space to just really be a little in, indulgent in a way and just think about the stories we want to tell. And Khalil, can you also talk to us about Black News, which is here at New Frontier this year, and, and how that is part of your, as a creative practice, you know, what values you've learned from that that we can build off of here as a community? Yeah. Um, <laughs> there's so much to talk about in relation to Black News, but I was definitely inspired by the Underground Museum, which, um, as you know, I'm a part of, um, hmm. and the power of the news media in shaping, I think, uh, some kind of collective consciousness. And um, as a filmmaker and now as an artist, I just, I just felt like no one was paying attention to the news in a way that was, you know, fundamental to us somehow creating our own version of that because that's what we do. We create, you know, we see something and we re we reappropriate it. Um, and, in, and when I say the news in a real way, there's been parodies and there, you know, there's a lot of examples of people playing with the news medium. So um, I pitched it to a bunch of networks. They all said no. So I, you know. I've been doing it myself, so. That's right, <laughs> holding still, that space. I mean, I have a ton of support, as anyone knows. No one uh, is singularly responsible for what they do. Um, but the Underground Museum has, was a huge um, catalyst, seeing how um, profound that was for the community. Um, and I remember thinking about Harriet Tubman a lot when my brother um, gave, came up with the, the name Underground Museum. Um, and I did a lot of research on the Underground Railroad and was just blown away. Because I don't know if Harriet Tubman would have considered herself an activist. Um, but clearly, <laughs> she, she was, um, maybe in retrospect. But the idea that you just have to do it, you know? And that's what I learned from my brother in the Underground. You just have to do it. You don't have to ask for people's permission or try to organize. Just, you know, and I also learned that anything great start, starts small. Um, so coming from a production background, productions aren't small. You, know? <laughs> you need a lot of money, you need a lot of people, you need a lot of paperwork. And then I you know, remember stories about Silicon Valley, things starting in their garage. So we literally started in our garage. And I think that I've learned that with Noah in the underground, it started super small. Him and his wife 
you know, got just a, a little space that they built out. And now we have museums from all over the place coming and, you know, trying to figure out how to implement th different things. Um, so yeah, I still, I still believe the Underground Railroad still exists. <laughs> You know, it was probably the most successful American enterprise of all time. Um, it fulfilled its means without almost any casualties or losses. And it was a huge collaboration between wealthy whites in the East Coast and, as you know, enslaved Africans in the South who were committed to each other. And, um, you know, we have this amazing documents now of what happened. So. That's been a model for us, and in fact, how we fundraise is based on the same fundraising principle of the Underground Railroad, yeah. Wow, I didn't know that. Oh my God, I wanna to talk to you guys for the rest of the day, but we got some other artists that we wanna hear from. Um, so can we give a big round of applause to Khalil and Elisa? It's beautiful. Uh, oh, I got the panther caught me. Um, so, we're gonna, we're gonna push these chairs back. We have um, uh, a performance by an incredible artist, Naima Ramos Chapman is coming to the stage. Um, and I just have to take a moment with everyone to say that she has um, been through an incredible, uh, an incredible festival. Not only does she have work here that is deeply meaningful, um, working with, um, uh, women that are kind of in, engaged in one way or another with the prison industrial complex and the, the emotional labor that she went through to bring that work here to the festival um, this year. Um, but she lost two dear um, family members and had to leave the festival yesterday to go to the, attend the funeral and then came back this morning to be here with us today. Um, so I just want to have a moment of silence for um, Sharon Davis, Chicky Chapman, and cousin Pooh Chapman, who um, are now ancestors and are with us today. So if we can just take one moment of silence and then we will give, it, give the stage to Naima.
Wow, give it up, y'all. That was love. That was love. That was love. I'm actually, um, I'm a performance artist, so I'm used to coming to stages to perform, and I wasn't sure that I would actually be able to be here today. We had a screening earlier, and I always wear a mask, and I just threw my mask on <laughs> in two seconds when my name was called, because I wasn't sure I would even be asked to come up here. So I'm honored, truly honored, to be here as part of this group of thinkers and artists. I was so moved to hear about um, the Underground Railroad, the impact of the Underground Railroad and the ph philosophy of it still being alive in us today and guiding us today. Um, <laughs> sorry, I'm a little bit nervous at having been asked to speak unexpectedly. Um, there are some concepts here um, I haven't even, I didn't even know about Jim Code. I don't know what that means. So again, this is also exciting and blowing my mind. Um, I'm a bit of a radical in my views. Um, I am um, interracial. Um, I sometimes am troubled to be grouped only with uh, black artists or artists of color. I question whether it's ghettoizing, and I know that that word ghettoizing is complicated in itself. Um, so I'm somebody who sometimes resists falling into those groups, and I ask whether is it really helping us as people of color or artists of color to form these coalitions and to separate ourselves or not? It's an ongoing question. Also, um, being a person of color and being a performer, I ask myself, am I really helping the fight for freedom, for liberation, or am I hindering it? Something that has troubled me somewhat here at Sundance is how many um, black performers there are at the parties. <laughs> and it doesn't matter what the party <laughs> is about. It doesn't mean, um, it's not necessarily that it's just a party about um, a black or African American person or for that cause. It's just this tradition of um, people of color, especially black people being asked to entertain <laughs> at parties. So um, when I was asked to perform here today, Although I wholeheartedly believe in this cause, I, I, it gave me pause somewhat <laughs> because um, I, just, I just, for the reasons that I just shared, I just find it complicated. I might, the work that I make is very erotic. It is very much about race and it is very much about gender. And I feel that the context in which it's presented is very complicated and also very essential. And I just didn't know what to expect here. I was also told that I would have to cover my breasts if I were to perform here. And the film that I have here at the festival is called Narcissister Breastwork. And it's about the legality of women bearing their breasts in the street of New York. So it felt <laughs> that it was, um, 
presented a real conflict in me. Why would I agree to perform um, and to basically hide my body, my female body, as if it's shameful or dangerous when my film is about liberating um, those bodies? The last thing I want to say that's also a little bit complicated is that within this spectrum of artists, all of us of color, um, we all sit in a diff different levels of support and funding for our processes. Um, perhaps because I'm a woman, perhaps because my work is erotic in nature and is complicated, I don't have the kind of funding that some of the artists here have. I don't have a studio with studio assistants. <laughs> and when I'm asked to perform at events, um, not only because I'm sharing so much of my body, um, but I need to be properly compensated. Um, and it just is a general question, I think, that I can't, I can't be the token uh, black woman performer who represents that women are free and that eroticism is okay in this world and not feel that the compensation for my effort and for the sharing of my body is not um, where it should be. <laughs> so I... <laughs> I want to thank you all for welcoming me to this stage so spontaneously. I know I must look really wild right now. <laughs> this is part of um, my, just the ethos and the aesthetic of my character. Um, and if you would like to find out more about my work, again, it's Narcissister, and my film here is called Narcissister Breastwork. And we have another screening on Friday, and we have another one on Saturday. So I'm honored. Thank you so much for having me. <laughs> Thank you all for being here today. And one more thing, we want a special thanks to Cross Currents Foundation, Ken and Micheline. We see you, we acknowledge you, and we thank you. Thank you. Everybody, 2020 Sundance Film Festival.